today I want to talk about towards low-level embodied intelligence. So a little about myself, I'm a research scientist at Google Behind. Uh, I graduated from Stanford. I worked with uh, Silvio Zarazzi and Leo Guitlas, and I, uh, my, my mentor, my first mentor was Amir, and we worked on this embodied intelligence, uh, embodied perception. And uh, my mission is to build intelligent embodied agents that can interact with a complex and unstructured real-world environment, such as human homes. Right, so in the, uh, what is embodied intelligence? It means an, an agent that it in, is intelligent and generally physically capable that can interact with the complex world. So um, for a long time in robotics, there is Moravec's paradox. Moravec's paradox is an observation that is in artificial intelligence and robotics that the easy problems are hard and that the seemingly hard problems are easy. So for example, you can have the, the AI uh, be the chess champion uh, of human, but uh, you still need uh, someone to move the chess piece, right? So the, the physical capability of the robots are not, still not there yet. And um, um, robots has been, in the, in the last three, four decades, have been uh, relatively slow, although a lot of the progress has been made, but uh, still we don't have our uh, home robots yet. So uh, we think foundation model might be able to change that. Another motivation is the other convention. Before we can get to godlike AI, we need to go through doglike AI. So what is a doglike AI? It's an AI that is generally capable in the environment. It can move around, it can grab things for you. Um, some argue GPT-4 might already be able to do this. However, um, Yellen argued that the three people power robot couldn't clean up the dinner table and fill up a dishwasher, uh, which a 10 year old people can do. And also, there is a problem of sample efficiency. Um, like, um, the, the human can learn to drive within uh, 20 hours of practice, while AI needs to feed a huge amount of data. Right, so we, are, we don't have the top like AI yet. So, uh, most recently, uh, language model has taken um, the world, like they're changing the world. Um, there are large language models that can explain jokes, they can have a fluent conversation with you, they can help you write emails and everything. There are also visual language models that um, can understand the environment. You can ask questions about an image, you can ask it to caption an image for you and do all, all sorts of great things. Um, however, uh, robotics are traditionally difficult because uh, real-world data collection is difficult to scale. That's also the motivation previously why we use simulators. And human demonstration is also a bottleneck. So um, it's hard to uh, come, so robotics data are hard to come along. Um, and autonomous collection requires a lot of bootstrapping, and sim to real uh, does not offer real world diversity. And the sim to real is also an open problem. It's, there, there's no uh, agreed upon solution of sim to real. Um, we are thinking about using large language models uh, to provide both knowledge and provide semantic knowledge of the environment and use them in robotics. We can try to take a large language model knowledge into robotics. Our first adventure in this uh, line of work is called SAFEN. So SAFEN is from large language model in robotic affordances. So the insight is that language model can hallucinate, uh, but uh, you can run them in robotic affordances. So language model tell you what to need. And there is a separate module we call affordance uh, that tell you what you can do here. So let me just play this uh, uh, chip. So in, in the chip, there is a user asked uh, the robot a question. I spill my drink uh, on the table, how would you throw it away and bring it something to help clean? And then there is a language model doing the planning for the robot. The language model is the brain of the robot. And there is a holdance function uh, serving as the eye of the robot. It's deciding what the robot can do in a certain spot. And there is the manipulation policy serving as hands. Uh, of the robot, right? So, um, hands of the language model. So, the, the, the planning module helps you or find a code and throw a little code and later bring you a sponge. So, this is our first adventure in uh, using language model in robotics. We have been through quite a journey. So, first, we use language model as a plan 
and we use Q function uh, as a toilet model uh, to ground the language model and do some grounded planning. Uh, then we essentially find um, the low level manipulation policy becomes a bottleneck. The language model is so capable, it can do a lot of planning problems with very high accuracy. Uh, but the low level manipulation policy becomes a bottleneck. So then we develop the uh, one, which is a transformative robot policy that can uh, manipulate things around the environment and pick up uh, objects. It can do about 700 different tasks at a 97% uh, success rate. So uh, we have a very capable uh, low level manipulation policy. So after say can, we also did something on another model on a high level. It's called Pong E. It's uh, the largest uh, vision language model to date. It's a, it's a vision language model, so it takes in both uh, the image data and language data. It's trained on both web and embodied data. Uh, so it can do better planning than just using language models. So essentially, in say can, there's language model, there's value function. Uh, you combine them to do planning, but in Palm E, the value function or the affordances are absorbed into the language model itself. So you can tell it a certain robot embodiment you can plan with that certain robot embodiment in mind. And uh, most recently, we have the RT2, which is a natural progression of RT1. So RT1 is our first iteration of a robot transformer. Uh, RT2, we essentially unify um, the, the web scale VLM as a robot policy, and it can generalize to new tasks and situations. You can even do something that is only possible with a large bench model, such as chain of thought reasoning. So, you can do chain of reasoning for robot manipulation. So in this talk, um, I will focus on RT2 and another world. I will talk about low-level embodied intelligence. Essentially, how do we get to the dog-like AI? Uh, I, and I happen to have a dog here. So um, one work that I want to mention is language to rewards. So we use language model to generate the reward functions and then do real-time behavior synthesis. Um, and then I'll talk about RT2. We are still using foundation models, we are still using large language models. However, the problems of low-level embodied intelligence is much harder because you could argue that for high-level reasoning or high-level embodied intelligence, um, it's closer to the large language model training in Cobra. So in the large language model, it has read a lot of books, it has read a lot of recipes, and it happened to read all your Wikipedia articles. So it has all this knowledge about planning and doing a certain task. However, um, it's much harder for language model to reason that you need to move your hand to the right one centimeter, or you need to twist your arm, or you need to um, kind of move your finger in a certain way. Those low-level motions are a lot harder, but it's not impossible. So there are two ways to do it. Uh, the first work I will talk about is language to rewards or robotic skill synthesis. Um, and uh, it, it is a recent work with a lot of collaborators. Um, the, the leading author is Wen Hao and Rob. They are both from Google DeepMind. Um, so let's uh, assume we have this problem. We, we have a robot dog. Uh, a, a robot dog uh, has a lot of degree of freedom, and you want the robot dog to stand up on two feet. Right? So you can directly ask the language model how do you make a robot dog stand up on two feet? And it will recite a big paragraph back to you. And upon reading it, you find it's actually quite reasonable. So it says the robot torso needs to be upright, you need to balance on the hind feet. Um, and it also tells you something um, oddly specific, like it needs to be the, the hind feet need to be shoulder width apart from back need to relax in the air. So um, these are all nice, but the problem is that you cannot apply them on robots. So it's not clear how you translate those texts into robot motions. There is another way to do it. Um, we have the robot API. So uh, we previously have a paper uh, for this policy is essentially using the program synthesis way of um, uh, generating robot motions. However, here you will get kind of mixed results because a uh, language model would not necessarily know your robot APIs and they don't know what the parameters means. So we propose a new, new, uh, new framework. So we have a reward translator, which translates a human instruction into a set of rewards. This is also a new way of viewing skills. So one way to view skills is it is a policy pie that maps observation to actions. Alternatively, you can also have a more 
higher level definition of skills. So the skills is a set of constraints and a set of objective functions. So take picking up objects as an example. So picking up objects is a skill, uh, but what it really means is your hand need to be close to an object and the object need to be on the supporting surface. This is arguably more generalizable representation of a skill and they can be represented in reward functions. As a get reward function, we can have a motion controller to generate the motion. So or, or you can use reinforcement learning. So previously we have been using reinforcement learning a lot, but in this particular work, we use a black box optimizer called Mojoko MPC, which can uh, get motion in real time. So here is an illustration. Let's open a box for reward translator. So reward translator uh, essentially taking in the human instruction and then first to translate to a description of the, the motion. Remember, we see the description of motion and we quite like it. We think it's very useful. So we just ask the language model, describe this motion in a certain templated language. And then we have a reward coder, which uh, is a, a Python program synthesizer. So both are just a language model with different prompts. We find this two-stage process are actually helpful because they, they can uh, better extract um, the uh, internet knowledge or large dimensional knowledge about motions and apply them onto robots. The insight is that from the, um, from the uh, internet knowledge and to the robot motion, there is a huge domain gap. So you want to bridge those domain gap by uh, saying, by going through some intermediate representations. And the motion description seems to be a good one. Uh, let's take a look at the motion controller. So the motion controller is the Joko MPC, which essentially is a black box optimizer. You can plug in any other black box optimizer here, but since we, um, we are using the simulated environment, um, it, it, it seems uh, convenient to use this Joko MPC, and it's really fast, and it can generate a lot of different motions. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at how the system works to give everyone a sense. So we can say, make the robot stand up on two feet like a human, and it does that. Um, now we can even give it more requests because we're using language models. Language model is also a great user interface. So you can give it additional instructions, you can give it corrections, and then you can say, okay, now make the robot do a little, do a moonwalk while standing up like this. So we're getting a little bit more ambitious. We uh, try to make it do, do the moonwalk in Michael Jackson's lab. So the robot attempted something here. Um, it generated the reward function and generated the motion. However, the motion is not exactly elegant. It's not a, the moonwalk that we are after. So then we can explain nicely to the robots that moonwalk means the robot should walk backward while the feet swings as if they are moving forward. Correct your answer and also make it walk at the speed of 0 0.5 meter per second. And as you can see, uh, the, uh, the language model surgically um, added the code so that now they're correct and they generate the motion um, of the, uh, the moonwalk. I'm not sure how the chips will show up through Zoom, but if not, you can go to language to rewards uh, github.io to see uh, this particular example and uh, a ton of other examples. You can also teach a language model to do a procedure, like you can say open a door, uh, put the apple in the door, uh, release the apple, move the hand away, and close the door. So this is a very high degree of freedom problem. So the, we, we mounted a shadow branch, uh, a shadow arm, shadow hand onto a branch arm. We, we, we call it shadow branch. It's a very high degree of freedom control problem, but uh, with the language to reward plus multiple MPC, we're able to solve this. Uh, we are we benchmark on, on a lot of tasks, and we also have some real world demos. Again, uh, we can go to language to rewards, uh, to take a look. Um, I guess I will take questions at the end, so uh, I will move on to the second part of this talk, uh, which is RT2. So RT2 uh, is uh, our another attempt of uh, using large language models to generate the low-level motions. So uh, we have already seen we can use the reward function as a nice interface from a large language model to generate uh, low-level motions. So the RT2 is more like, can we generate the low-level motions uh, directly from the language model? Can the robot language model, can the language model speak robot language? Can it 
directory output model commands. And we fine tune this uh, special language model so that they can also be a robot policy. So um, the, the, uh, the gist of the RT2 is that we have a visual language model that is pre-trained on the internet data. So, um, I, so we, we have a, a big uh, visual language model. And then we can uh, fine tune it with only a little bit of robot data. So we use the RT1 data to fine tune this visual language model. And now, not only it can finish all the tasks uh, in the RT1 training suite, but it can also generalize. It maintains some of the internet knowledge, uh, some world knowledge uh, inherited from the vision language model. Right, so there is also a talk um, before uh, this about visual pre-training. So essentially, we are having the vision language pre-training in robot robotic policy. So it's, it's just a, a, a huge uh, pipeline and curriculum of tasks. So uh, a brief introduction of the visual language model, I guess it doesn't require that much of an introduction. It's a, um, a, a model, a transformer model, uh, to be exact. And here is the uh, encoder, decoder, encoder, decoder language model with a VIT uh, vision head uh, on top of it. And uh, you can do a lot of different things with this visual language model. It's, it's a very general representation of uh, visual tasks, right? It's, text and image in, and then text out. Um, the the VLMs encompasses both visual and semantic understanding of the world. And you can ask it to do visual question answering and captioning and all other tasks. And those happens to be very important capabilities in robotics. Right? In robotics, we have to deal with a lot of visual and semantic understanding. And now the question is how do we leverage all of those knowledge um, we can actually convert this vision language model into a robot policy. So here is a brief um, architecture uh, showing the architecture of the RT1. So RT1 is also a, a robot policy, but it's not just any robot policy. It's a language conditioned one. So it's conditioned on human instruction. So given a human instruction and a series of camera images, we have um, a transformer, a transformer block, although a, a very efficient one, we developed some efficient transformer architecture so that we can run on the body real time. Um, we have it as a policy, we have this robotic transformer as a policy, and it, it can generate actions. So we tokenize language, we tokenize uh, Im camera images, and we tokenize actions. And then we can output those tokenized actions. So uh, if we zoom out a little bit, it's the, the two architectures, the vision and model, and the robot policy are very, very similar. So RT1 is also image plus text plus to, to uh, the discrete robot actions. And it's quite similar to vision and models with different output tokens. The only thing is we need the vision and model to speak robot language, which are those action tokens. And we also have a question, if we do this kind of fine tuning, does it still maintain its visual understanding of the world, or it, it, it is essentially overfitted to the robot world? So that's something we want to figure out in RT2. So we can use, directly use the large visual language models as a policy. Um, the other question is how do we deal with actions when using the briefing VLMs? So here is how we represent actions in the, the in VLMs, and I would like to say that. This is the active research direction. So there are many different ways for you to deal with action representation. Some action representation happen to be more, uh, let's say, efficient or um, slightly better uh, sample efficiency or um, easy to learn, like how friendly it is to VLMs or how easy it is to transfer knowledge from machine language models to robot uh, policies, right? Different action representation are, are different. So our robots, um, it's also depending on the robot topology. Our robot can have 70 degree of freedom arm with a, with a gripper. So we represent everything using the anti vector, essentially the gripper delta pose um, and the gripper closeness. So there are eight dimensions of the actions. We discrete each into 256 pins and we convert it to a string of numbers. We're literally just using a string of numbers. It's Probably not the most efficient representation, but we find it works. 
Uh, we tried some other things, floating numbers. Uh, floating numbers require small tokens, language models, not the best at understanding decimals. Uh, we also convert it to human language, left or right, uh, but uh, it's also ambiguous. It cannot be directly executed on the robot. And we, after blading the uh, robot action representation, we settled on this uh, uh, discrete naming of uh, eight dimensions, and uh, uh, we find it empirically to be working well, although we, we might be able to uh, find other action representations. After this last piece, we now have a vision language action model. Uh, we have two architectures. One is Pavians, uh, um, and another one is Pavi. So um, we, the, the data to train these, like to train the visual language model, is of course the web data. Uh, and after that, we combine it with some robot data. We use the same RT1 data, so we can have a fair comparison with RT1. There are human demonstrations collected by fishing robots over 17 months. Um, so, and then we have a procedure called cofine tuning. Essentially, we just add the robot data into the pre tuning mix. We are not just fine tuning on the language, uh, on the robot data because we worry about overfitting. And it, it seems that the cofine tuning procedure also has some um, advantages of maintaining the, the vision language capability of this VLM. And at inverse time, what, what we end up doing is we given the, uh, we essentially use RPQ. Uh, the VLM as a, as a policy, um, we can have a tokenized uh, text and uh, uh, image input, and we have the tokenized action output, which is eight numbers. Each of them is between uh, zero to 255, and we can detokenize them into delta posts and uh, directly execute them on the robot. And we do this in a closed loop manner. Uh, the the, the uh, vision language model can actually run pretty fast on the cloud. Uh, so we can run it up to 3 hertz. Uh, we can have this close of control by getting the oscillation, um, generating action, and then uh, essentially do this loop over and over again until it finishes some tasks. So we find we can do some quite interesting tasks, including pick the nearly falling bag, and you need to reason about which bag is nearly falling, and pick up the object that is different. So I will go more uh, into details in a little bit. So here is an illustration of uh, uh, what the tasks that they can do. So all of these tasks are on the distribution. They are not in the RT1 training distribution. So we are playing with the policies the, the same way we play with check to be key. We essentially just prompt it with different things, uh, just like how we the intelligence of a, of a three-year-old, for example. Um, the other thing is that a lot of the objects are um, the robot that I have already seen it in the training data, so we need to literally need to run to the dollar, dollar store to buy a bunch of toys and then to test the generalization capability of the robots. So it can do things like move the banana to German flag on the top right, so it uh, um, understands different flags, and it, uh, it has semantic understanding of different things, and in the middle, let's put the strawberry into the correct bowl, so you need to understand what is a strawberry, a correct ball is a strawberry ball, and then uh, do this uh, sort of one of reasoning and association. Right, so I think this, these are pretty cool capabilities. Um, yes, so here are a list of tasks. So for, for more details, please um, uh, go into read our paper, and we, we have more uh, the skills to, to show. Uh, we did some benchmarking of uh, um, how all these compare with different other robot models, uh, including VC1, uh, which is uh, another visual model uh, control policy, and we compare with R1, or with iteration of robot transformer, and we find that um, the, the RT2 performs much better in uh, those tasks that require some model knowledge or requires semantic knowledge. Right, so. Um, we also find it is more robust to, uh, let's say, background noise. Uh, unseen background, they generalize better to unseen environments. Right, so uh, this would be the attitude. I uh, wouldn't go to the, uh, detail into the quantitative results. Uh, but uh, we, we find co fine tuning uh, helps. Co fine tuning helps you maintain the uh, visual capability of these models. And uh, uh, fine tuning on robot data, we 
you probably have better end distribution performance, but then your auto distribution performance is a little bit worse. And training on robot data from scratch barely work, works, right? So you do need a large pre-training procedure of the machine language model uh, before you can find training on the robot, before you can like, find training on the robot data. And uh, maybe it's another signal that the robot data is just not enough to uh, like making a vision language model converge. Uh, we also tried another environment. So uh, this is also, we can use the same model in different environments, and it can essentially calibrate uh, which is the distribution of each environment, and it can do uh, different tasks. Uh, in so this is a table top environment, and it can also ask you to push the catch up to the blue cube. So the catch up is actually auto distribution. It has never seen catch up before. But uh, well, it has never seen catch up before in the robot training data, I should say. Uh, but it's able to do this task. And it was high success rate. Uh, one interesting thing is the Qing Alpha reasoning. So Qing Alpha reasoning is a prompting method uh, in the in large language models, uh, which uh, uh, proposed by uh, Jason and uh, a few of uh, my other colleagues. Um, so we can now do the Qing Alpha reasoning with uh, a vision language model too, and also on a robot. It's, it's, it's a very interesting experiment. So uh, essentially, the way we do it is we have this pre-trained RT2 model, and we fine tune it on a little bit of data, maybe a couple hundreds of data that contains um, like a prompt, a plan, and an action. So it has an intermediate plan step. It's not completely in context learning, so it requires a little bit of training, but it doesn't require a ton of data. It's more like calibrating the output format to some uh, to, to a different new format. And with this uh, chain of thought reasoning, you can uh, make it generate a plan and then get actions, and it can do more complicated tasks um, just to, with generating the explanation and then generate actions. So one interesting experiment we did is to put on the table a rock, a piece of paper, and uh, a, a fat set. And then we asked, given the image, I need to have a nail, what well, object from the scene might be useful? And it says rock, and then generate action to pick up the rock. So this is just one example, but you can do a lot of uh, different things for the chain of thought model. So uh, another thing that we did is to ask you to pick up the object that is different. What does different mean? Different means, uh, well, this is a snack, the rest of the objects are things, so you have to pick up the snack. You can also ask things in uh, other languages, then the plan would essentially be to translate this into English. So it gives it more opportunity to bridge the gap between uh, different domains. So um, last example that I want to show is to move the green object, uh, move the green objects together. So this is actually kind of interesting because the plan actually oscillated a little bit. So you can move up green object one to green object two, but you can also move green object two to green object one. And it oscillated a little bit, and then um, once it's close enough to uh, one object, and then it's a commit to that object and finishes the task. All right, so uh, finally, um, I would like to conclude this talk. So we have um, uh, a vision management model that uh, can improve generalization. Uh, we have this RTG model. Uh, it can work on green tasks and new objects. Uh, it can even reach out to our and it improve the, the underlying model. Uh, improving the underlying management model can improve robot control, so we see a lot of transfer from a uh, vision management model to, to robots, and it can do a lot of novel tasks. So essentially, we fuse the vision management model and the robot policy into one, and we see a lot of generalization. In the future, we want to increase the motion diversity, uh, so we we've currently refine Profane information language model or robot data uh, end up resulting in a very highly regularized robot policy. So it maybe it doesn't have the motion diversity that we want. We also want to extend the uh, channel sub capabilities uh, um, to like, more, more planning, more, more complicated planning and reasoning tasks. And, uh, and many more on the directions to explore in the problem. So this is again a collaboration with uh, many colleagues in, um, in our team, and it's a huge amount of work. Uh, so kudos to uh, folks uh, who, who made this work possible. 
kudos to uh, other teams like Neil uh, also did a talk earlier today. So the, the vision platform is also, also a key component and the, the, the vision language model is a key component in our uh, line of work. So to, to conclude my talk, uh, we made some progress in getting a uh, lot of technology intelligence. Uh, we can, uh, we need to define the right interface to mine all of our large language models and uh, reward functions might be one. Um, and also, we can treat global action as a foreign language. The moment we treat global action as a foreign language, we can uh, borrow some knowledge from the pretending mix and then apply them on the bodies. And uh, then we can do large scale internet data plus uh, some robot data that enables uh, generalization and uh, uh, more robust robot policies. Uh, thank you so much. Let me know if you have any questions. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the talk. It's very interesting. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, from what I understand, like the robot policies are like, specifically fighting the detaining data. So, do you think there is a way to combine this with enforcement learning? Like, the robot actions on its own? Yeah, I think, I think that's a super good question. So, um, currently, we are using behavior cloning, we are using human demonstration. So, all of these are uh, human demonstrations, and they are very difficult to collect. Um, and uh, it's definitely possible to use reinforcement learning. Uh, we, we, we have been exploring similar directions. So, uh, in the beginning of the, the um, the line of work, there is QT out, which is like using reinforced learning, and we, uh, we might have some follow up work on that regard. And I also want to mention that after you train this, you essentially get very good motion priors, right? Because visual language model can get a lot of prior knowledge of the world. So you might also uh, be able to use this as an exploration policy, and it's going to be a quite good exploration policy because it has a better understanding of the world and it also understands the, the robot motions. And that's all. All of you also have a temperature sample from those large dimension models. So you can have diversity uh, in your exploration. Like you might be able to do really good exploration with uh, these uh, robot transformer models. Um, one question. Can, can you do learning from demonstration or mutation learning by putting the human demonstration into the prompt? Um, yeah, so we have it in this particular work, but uh, there is some work um, from NVIDIA that has worked on binaries. It's uh, one example of the, what they call a smart model prompt. So we can actually prompt it with a multi model goal. Uh, to extend this a little bit more, we can prompt it with a, with a video. Or uh, with the human demonstration. So then you can do some like, in context, uh, essentially in context um, mitigation learning. However, there are a couple of challenges there. For example, how do you represent video efficiently um, is not super clear. Um, like one frame uh, in our data is 256 tokens. So you quickly run out of the uh, uh, image tokens. You would quickly run out of the token space in large language models. So that's uh, probably one concern. Yeah, or right, for the sake of time, maybe we actually need to stop the panel. Uh, if, if it's very quick, please. Uh, yeah, sure, that's a very quick question. Do you work for your virtual signature? You apply it with a uh, module and PC. Do you think that it also works with uh, some uh, reinforcement learning tasks? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, but look, PC works in, in, in real time and it can generate motions in real time, so that's why it's quite good to us. Uh, however, in Rainbow's point of this actually might be a little bit better. You might be able to generate more stable policies, right? Because you can really optimize for the world. So, in Juba PC, you have the optimization horizon, so you really need to generate motion and move on within, let's say, 200 milliseconds. But uh, in real post learning, you have more time, which can actually give you better, more stable policy, probably easier to transfer to your robot. So, uh, real post learning is definitely also possible. All right.
Das ist ein Fehler.